my name is Meadowlock Lemon. I come from Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona at the moment. I hope to be there until Jesus comes. Uh, I played basketball uh, with the Harlem Globetrotters for approximately 24 years. I, I took the position of comedian um, uh, after the Goose Tatum left, uh, there were two people in between myself and uh, Goose Tatum, which was a span of about 12 months. Um, Showboat, Bob Showboat Hall was one, and I, I thought that Bob Showboat Hall was probably the best one-handed basketball player of all time. Uh, when Bob would get that ball in his mitt, it was like a vice. I mean, you guys would be hanging on with two hands trying to take it away from him. Uh, so I thought that Bob was the best at that. Um, Sam Wheeler was a little different. Uh, uh, he was a type of mentor for me. Um, Sam uh, had a couple of fingers missing on one hand uh, or the other, and uh, so he had to be a little faster uh, than the the Bob Hall and the, and the uh, Goose Tatum. So uh, I kind of mixed my stuff up in between them. Uh, Marcus Haynes uh, brought me to the team. Uh, he was the person who gave me my first shot. Um, I played as a comedian. Uh, I took some of the the things that I had learned from the older players, because in those days the older players were the teachers. You know, they 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 taught us how to play a game. Um, and those of us who didn't have fundamental skills, you know, uh, I did come with some fundamental skills. But what I learned from the older fellows took me steps farther. Um, and I, I believe today that we need those fundamental skills. Uh, as I teach basketball, uh, that's the first thing that I, I want to get across to the kids is the fundamental skills. You know, most of them have raw talent, uh, and we had a, raw ta a lot of raw talent with the Globetrotters in the, in the olden days. Um, but those skills that we had, it took us so much farther and being mentored by the older guys because each one of them out there was a coach and it wasn't one of those things where you could come in the dressing room after you really messed up and smile they'd probably knock your face off your head and watch it roll down the uh, the hall someplace uh, they didn't they didn't play that they were very very serious about what they did a lot of people thought because we did comedy we put comedy with basketball they didn't think that we were serious but when you begin to to do comedy and basketball together, and if you do it well enough, you know you're very, very skilled at it. And that's what these young, these older players were. And uh, I, I would just sit back and I would just marvel and watch them work out there, and how they would put us in the game little by little, so we could begin to learn how to play the game, not just comedy, but learn how to play the game of basketball itself. Um, I tried to learn every aspect of the game. You know, uh, if there wasn't a dribbler, I learned how to dribble. I learned how to slide. I learned how to put the ball on the floor. Uh, I, I became coach at one time, having to take whatever talent I could find and mold it into something that would look good. And uh, I, I was able to do that. But from what I had learned from the older players, I, I couldn't have done that. Um, you know, if I wasn't a, a dunk artist, but every now and then, you know, after about every 100 games, I could probably dunk one real quick. You know, not, not going up there and, and doing a whole lot of hang time. No, I had no hang time. I had quick time, you know, just get up there and, and put it through the hole quickly. Uh, and uh, there, you know, there were players who, who could, oh gosh, 
players like Johnny Klein, uh, who they would probably call for air dribble. You know, most people don't understand this. I know the rules on this that you could only take the ball uh, around your body. I think it's twice or once, whatever it was. Uh, but but Johnny could take it around there three times and just float through the air, and, and it's just like a butterfly flying through the air. Uh, we had Willie Gardner. Willie, six uh, eight. He left the team, went to, to play for the Knicks. Um, he would have been an outstanding NBA player, but uh, he had an injury. But Willie could dunk three basketballs at one time. And when people ask me, say, well, how good were you? Were you good at to the kids today? And I, I just have to tell them. You know, until I see somebody dunk the ball three ball balls at one time, you know, I I have to think about that. Um, uh, ja Jackie Jackson, Jackie said I jumped so high they had to name me twice. Jackie, I used to give that ball to Jackie every night. This is the truth. Uh, at the top of the circle, you know, Jackie on one a skip and a hop. There's nobody ever in this in this lifetime who could go as high as, as Jackie on, on that shot. I saw Wilch, the Big Dipper. We call him Dippy. Uh, I saw him do this twice. Dunk the ball, hit the floor, come back up through the basket, and then go down twice, then go back down through the basket again. So I don't know how you count that. I don't know if you count that as four points or what. But uh, I, I saw him do that twice. I saw him do it in the Polo Grounds in New York. And then I saw him do it in the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Uh, we had people like Bob Williams, who a power dunker. You know, we still got those now who could really power dunk. Um, who, we had so many athletes. Uh, we had so many great athletes. That, uh, it, it's hard to you know to, to visualize and think about their names right now. Let's move on to to your, I want you to recount, maybe this will help you get some more names. I want you to tell me about experiences on the bus, uh, in, the, in the locker room, on the floor. <laughs> Talk you, to don't me want, about, you don't want to know those things. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> well, we had fun. Um, it was, we were only one team among many, many teams out there. So it was basically like a family type situation. And I, I think that's the way Abe wanted it, to, to, to be kind of a, a family. Because we were on that bus, we would travel sometimes 500 miles on the bus. I mean, we'd leave early in the morning going to a place. We'd, we'd all day long on the bus play the game. And, and then we'd have to find a place to eat sometimes. And we'd travel another maybe 100, 200 miles just to find a place to eat and sleep. So we were, we were on that bus a lot. We played cards. Uh, the bus driver played cards with us. Uh, the bus driver would not only play cards with us, he would shave and do everything else because <laughs> we didn't have time uh, to do a whole lot of other things. Uh, but he would play. We we, we played a game called bid whist. I mean, and you got you talking about trash talking. See, we were the original trash talkers, and it probably started on on the bus playing bid whist. And uh, after bid whist, we would it would escalate sometime to poker. I, I mean, we play poker for anything. We play poker for matchboxes. We play poker for for. Uh, uh, pennies and dollars and whatever it took, but we would play all day long, all night long. Uh, so we were, we were together a lot in the dressing rooms. The dressing room was, was a lot of fun also. You know, we played cards, we talked to each other, we, I mean, we loved each other, we talked about the game, we, we rehearsed, uh, we, we played, we did the circle in there to make sure when we, when, when we hit that floor we were ready. And, uh, it, it, and if someone in that circle wasn't ready, he didn't go out there. We didn't allow that. Uh, we started the uh, three-point shot. I know when we did that, a lot of people say we were crazy, said it, was ne it would never work. But we had players on the team who, uh, 
who could shoot, uh, who could make seven out of ten. And, and, I, and I believe if you couldn't shoot that well, you couldn't shoot that, that three-pointer shot because it didn't make sense for somebody to shoot it and make five out of ten. No, we needed a seven out of ten. But we had a couple of people like Clarence Wilson, who on any given night he would shoot you ten for ten. We had people like Curly Neal with the touch like I'd never seen anybody else who could make, who could give you nine for ten and ten for ten. Bobby Joe Mason, who was so good that he didn't even have to prove himself. You know, he knew how good he was out there. Connie Hawkins, who were flying through the air like, uh, like nobody I've seen today. You know, uh, I think the young the young kids should try to get some of the old film if they can find it of Connie, how he would handle that ball and how he would fly through the air. Um, the dressing room was uh, was like home to us because we were on the road for a great deal of time. You mentioned Connie. Yeah. And how the, how the young kids should watch him. Talk to me about the difference between the young kids today and... Uh, you know, uh, uh, the young kids today have uh, a lot of toughness, you know, because of uh, the bumping and, and the pushing under the basket. But it was a different type of toughness that we had. You know, I, I don't believe that the young kids today could survive with what we had to go through off the court and then go on the court and perform at, at the level that we had to perform at. You know, um, when, when we did something funny, we had to score basket. And uh, whether it was from half court or at the top of the key or shooting a, a slam dunk, you know, but we, we had to be ready. And, uh, and, and, and today, um, I, I see a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, which is good. You know, a lot of players can do that. But uh, as, I, as I watch the NBA, and I, I do love the NBA, uh, I'll get some, one of the greatest promoters. Uh, the, the, the last two years, the team, the two teams that were in the, in, in the, in the finals were the teams who played, who gave you the give and go, the pick and roll, which means when you start doing that, you don't have a whole lot of time to, to go one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's a type of mindset there's, a, there's another type of toughness that you have to have, uh, a type of skills that you need to, to play those, to play the game the way I'm talking about now. Talk to me about, you talked about off the court. It's one yeah. last question about, about they didn't have to go, you mentioned that they didn't have to go through what you guys had to go through. The, talk to me about being a black, being a black team in America at the time that you guys were playing and what it was like even at home but more importantly when you guys would go on the road abroad talk to me about how you guys were perceived we were at a, another level you know we were not like the locals when we went to town um, we went to the hotel from the bus to the hotel and from the hotel to the game and back to the bus to the hotel and here you're getting out of town but there were places that we couldn't play. Uh, we couldn't stay, brother. You know, uh, as I said, we, there were times we'd have to travel all day long to play a game. Then we'd have to get, get out of town that night because we had no place to stay or eat. One of, one of the saddest things that I, I can remember, and it really touched my heart, uh, is in the Houston, Texas. Um, we, I mean, we had a great game in Houston. I think it was at the Coliseum there. I mean, it seemed like everything just went right. And uh, we were leaving town, going to, I can't remember where we were going to, uh, to get the, the hotel that we needed, and we wanted to eat. And there was no place for us to eat, so we, we stopped by the bus station so we could go around the back where they had a little window to, to pick up a couple of sandwiches and some soda pop. Um, and there was a, a, a car following the bus. and. The guy pulled up right be behind us, and uh, he came up to the bus. I was the first one to get off the bus, and he had his daughter in his arm, pretty little blonde-haired girl. Uh, she couldn't have been more than seven or eight. And she leaped out of his arms into my arms and began to hug and kiss me. And, and 
her dad just started weeping. I mean, he just started crying, and and his daughter was just laughing and loving on me. And he whispered in my ear, he said, this is the first time I've ever seen my daughter laugh like that. And Meadowlark, she's dying of some rare disease that she had. Now, both of us are crying out there. And uh, when it was all over, she went back to her dad. And I had to go around to the back of the bus station for that little window to pick up my sandwich. Uh, this was some of the things that were happening. But these are some of the things that we, the barriers that we help break down. Uh, we begin to, people would begin to see things that we were doing out there and the joy. You know, uh, you know, the Bible talks about, about joy. And it's like a medicine. When people are laughing, you know, you can't frown. Uh, I guess that's one of the, the reasons why I'd love to go to the hospitals with a man called Peg Leg Bates, who was one of the halftime uh, entertainers. And uh, Peg Leg, with, uh, he had a pig. And uh, going to the hospitals, he, could, he would go to, down those uh, hallways like he could barely walk. And Peg could walk better than most of us and could run and jump and everything else. But when he get to the hospital, you know, you could hear that, that pig coming down the hallways, clunk clunk and he had a he had a couple of fingers missing off of his uh, both hands and he would walk up down the hallways something like this and uh, uh, if people were really sick and dying and uh, he would tell them he said do you know who I am my leg, my name is pig leg Bates and I'm a one-legged dancing fool and Peg would seem like he'd jump about four feet high. And when he'd come down, he was dancing. And people began to cheer and laugh because joy good good like a medicine. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> All right. Talk to me. Black legend question. Yep. Mm. Talk to me about what formation of the Black Legends Foundation in 1996 has done for oh. <laughs> you guys as alumni, but also what you think it's going to do for society? Black Legends. I, I really don't think I'm a, a legend myself. Uh, There's so many other guys out there, man. I mean, who, who brought this thing to where it is today. Uh, gosh, you know, when I... When I He's talking about the Black Legends Foundation. Okay, yeah, I'm, I was going to get to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, uh, I, 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 I don't think I'm a black legend because of the guys who came before me that people don't even know anything about. People like Babe Presley and Duke Cumberland, who Duke lost his hair, started losing his hair as a kid. And, and he would go on the corner in the sand lot and hustle all the young kids out there. They saw the old man coming out there, and they would, they would say, well, I can outshoot the boys. And, and he, he would manipulate these kids. Uh, we, Ted Strong, and people don't even know this, he was one of the first one who they came to uh, to play a professional baseball before they came to Jackie Robinson. You know, they came to people like Ted Strong. People don't even know about these people. Uh, Frank Washington, people don't know about them because they are the legends. They are the legends of our time. Uh, the Black Legends Foundation is, is, is something that uh, um, Dr. Klein has put together to let people know about these black legends. and. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, his Black Legends uh, Foundation will educate the people on what went down even before Meadowlock Lemon and some of the other ball players that's, that's out there today. Talk to me about, you told me about where you came from, mm. your career, some of the people that you recall playing with. Talk to me about where you are today. 
Where has oh. this brought you? Oh, this is this this has brought me full circle. Uh, I'm in the full time ministry. I work in the office as an evangelist. I travel all over the country and, and the other countries. Um, pretty soon I'll be really doing a lot of work in a lot of other countries, but uh, I'm called to the local churches, which means that the local churches have families. As a globetrotter, I entertain the families, and in the families, we have children, and uh, I can entertain and minister to the young kids, um, not only in the inner city, but in the outer city, gang members on the reservations, Native Americans. This is where my heart is. My heart is to minister, entertain our families and uh, young people. This is what I do today, and I, I travel all over, all over the country. I put on basketball camps, which is part of the ministry that, that I'm in. I enjoy this better than anything, and uh, I intend to keep on keeping on. A lot of people ask me, how did you come into this, and why, why are you into this? And I, and I, I had to ask uh, one of the mentors of mine, uh, a man by the name of uh, Kenneth Copeland, Dr. Kenneth Copeland. Uh, I, I asked him, I said, well, man, how it, why are so many athletes coming into the ministry full time? He said, man, all you have to do is turn the page. He said, because the same boldness that you had on the basketball court and on the athletic field, you need that same boldness in the pulpit. And he's been so right. That same kind of toughness that we have out there, we got to have as a minister.